Hey guys, it's me, Seren, back with another video. It is day four of Hidden Figures. Let me go ahead and preface this by saying that they're doing some work outside of my apartment. So you guys might hear some like clanging and banging around. If it gets too loud, then uh, I might stop uh, and pick this video up later or refilm it. But I'm going to try and film it now. So if the noise stays down to a minimum, you guys might hear some noise. So just bear with me. Um... I'm really excited about today's hidden figure, uh, Ethel Payne, um, who was a journalist. And what's wild is like, I have a whole degree in journalism and I've never heard of this woman. Um, and I actually saw her, someone suggested her on Twitter. And then while I was doing my research, I came across a really great article about her uh, on PBS, which of course there will be links in the description box. But I'm gonna go ahead and read you guys uh, a little blurb from the, from the PBS uh, piece before I get started. She may be the most influential journalist and activist most people have never heard of. Ethel Payne began her writing career at the Chicago Defender, a storied black newspaper that specialized in telling stories left uncovered by the mainstream white-owned press. Payne traveled the world, covered every president from Eisenhower to Reagan, traveled to Vietnam and repeatedly to Africa. She was front and center at the Montgomery bus boycott, at the desegregation of Little Rock Central High School, and at the 1963 March on Washington. Over time, she came to be known as the first lady of the black press, but her ground work, her groundbreaking work, excuse me, has been obscured by time. Isn't that such a good intro? Isn't it wild? Like, I literally have a whole degree in journalism. Like, I've spent years studying journalists, literally. And I've never heard of Ethel Payne, right? Hidden fucking figures. Ethel Lois Payne, born August 14th, 1911, and died May 28th, 1991, was an African-American journalist. Known as the first lady of the black press, she was a columnist, lecturer, and freelance writer. She combined advocacy with journalism as she reported on the civil rights movement during the 1950s and 60s and was known for asking questions others dared not ask. First published in the Chicago Defender in 1950, she worked for that paper through the 19. 70s, becoming, Washington, becoming a Washington correspondent and editor. She became the first female African-American commentator employed by a national network when CBS hired her in 1972. I'm going to read that again. She became the first female African-American commentator employed by a national network when CBS hired her in 1972. So, like, there would be no Joy Reid without this woman. There would be no Melissa Harris Perry without this woman. Like, why are we not taught about Ethel Payne? At least in journalism school, it's wild. In addition to her reporting of American domestic politics, <clears throat> she also covered international stories. I'm still trying to, to break this cold, y'all. I'm still trying to kick this cold. Excuse my, my voice. Born in Chicago, Illinois, the granddaughter of slaves, Ethel Lois Payne yearned to be a writer at a time when few such opportunities existed for African American women. She attended Lindblom High School, where one of her writing teachers had also taught Ernest Hemingway. She began her journalism career rather unexpectedly while working as a hostess at an Army Special Services Club in Japan, a position she had taken in 1948, which I'm just going to like interject again. So... She got this position in 1948 when she was 37 years old. So here's someone that became known as, you know, the first lady of the black press that became the first, you know, female black American commentator when she got hired by CBS. And she didn't even start her journalism career until she was 37 years old. So another theme that we're seeing a lot in these hidden figures is never give up and it's never too late and you're never too old to do whatever you want to do. She allowed a visiting reporter from the Chicago Defender to read her journal, which detailed her own experiences as well as those of African-American soldiers. Impressed, the reporter took the journal back to Chicago, and soon Payne's observations were being used by the Defender, an African-American newspaper with a national readership as the basis for front-page stories. In the early 1950s, Payne moved back to Chicago to work full-time for the Defender. After working there for two years, she took over the paper's one-person bureau in Washington, D.C. In addition to... Oh, that was loud. Okay. In addition to national assignments, Payne was afforded the opportunity to cover stories overseas. We might have to take a break, y'all. They're, like, redoing the ground or something. I don't know. Like, the floor. They're, like, jackhammering or something. 
Okay. In the early 1950s, Payne moved back to Chicago to work full-time for the Defender. After working there for two years, she took over the paper's one-person bureau in Washington, D.C. In addition to national assignments, Payne was afforded the opportunity to cover stories overseas, becoming the first African-American woman to focus on international news coverage, and only one of three accredited African-Americans on the White House press corps. During Payne's 25-year career with the Defender, she covered several key elements in the civil rights movement, including the Montgomery bus boycott and desegregation at the University of Alabama in 1956, as well as the 1963 March on Washington. She and the famous African-American author Richard Wright attended the 1955 Bandung Conference, and Wright showcased some of his exchanges with her in his 1956 book, The Color Curtain, a report on the Bandung Conference. Payne earned a reputation as an aggressive journalist who asked tough questions. She once asked President Dwight D. Eisenhower when he planned to ban segregation and interstate travel. The president's angry response that he refused to support special interests made headlines and helped push civil rights issues to the forefront of the national debate. In 1966, she traveled to Vietnam to cover African-American troops who were involved in much of the fighting. And yet again, she was the first female black American international correspondent, amazing. She subsequently covered the Nigerian Civil War and the International Women's Year Conference in Mexico City and accompanied Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, 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 let me know, on a six nation tour of Africa. In 1972, she became the first African American woman radio and television commentator on a national network, working on CBS's program Spectrum from 1972 to 1978, and after that with matters of opinion until 1982. In 1978, Payne became an associate of the Women's Institute for Freedom of the Press, WIFP. WIFP is an American nonprofit publishing organization, and the organization works to increase communication between women and connect the public with forms of women based media. On May 28, 1991, at the age of 79, Payne died of a heart attack at her home in Washington, D.C. Ethel Payne was one of four journalists honored with the U.S. postage stamp in a Women in Journalism set in 2002. Prompted by her work in Africa as a foreign correspondent and to honor the name of a journalist who covered seven U.S. Pres presidents excuse me, and was a war correspondent, the National Association of Black Journalists award Ethel Payne fellowships to journalists interested in obtaining international reporting experience through assignments in Africa. Several of Ethel Payne's belongings and awards are on view at the Anacostia Community Museum in Washington, D.C. And the quote that I'm going to read you is this. In an interview a few years prior to her death, Payne said, I stick to my firm, unshakable belief that the black press is an advocacy press and that I, as a part of that press, can't afford the luxury of being unbiased. When it comes to issues that really affect my people, I plead guilty because I think that I am an instrument of change. We don't all have the luxury of being quote unquote unbiased, which I think is a really important quote and a really important message during these times of what we're going through right now. Because something that they, they do initially kind of ask you and have you work around when you're in J school is, you know, you see someone get shot, you see someone get blown up, you see someone that's starving, you see someone that needs help. Do you step in and help or do you kind of stay, you know, behind the camera or behind your pen to remain unbiased? And, and why people love that unbiased shit. Oh, I'm unbiased, just the facts, just the facts. It's like, but are we live in a biased fucking ass world and society we have to course correct and we have to cover shit the way that it is and the way that it matters. So I'm actually going to read that quote again because it's super important. I stick to my firm, unshakable belief that the black press is an advocacy press and that I, as a part of that press, can't afford the luxury of being unbiased. When it comes to issues that really affect my people, I plead guilty because I think that I am an instrument of change. Ethel Payne an amazing, amazing, amazing hidden figure. See you guys tomorrow. Peace. Oh, this shit is really bugging out. It's really fucking with me, hard body.